Hello and welcome to another episode of the Don't Give a Ruck podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Parker, and joining me on this week's pod is the former Northampton Saints and England scrum half, Lee Dixon. Lee, who is now teaching and coaching at Barnard Castle School since his retirement in 2019, has 18 England caps to his name, as well as a Gallagher Premiership winner's medal from 2014. I began by asking Lee whether there's been much banter going round on his return to Barnard Castle School after England's priceless victory over France on Saturday. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a rating on our iTunes page. Enjoy the show. Uh, Well, the one thing I I sort of miss from school is maybe something happening on the weekend and just not, like, can't wait to get back into school on Monday to talk to my friends about (laughs) it. And uh, is that that banter been going on today about the England game on Saturday? Yeah, I think a few of them have gone around about it. You know, there's always that key before because we have Saturday school. So you have Saturday school and then obviously all the chat is the games and then they come back in today and you've got people going, I told you so, I had that. You know, or, or, it wasn't as bad as the old Mike Brown wearing a, a Welsh shirt at training, yeah. but there's, there's, there's bits and bobs going around. A lot, to be fair, it's great listening to the range of kids' opinions. So you get your, your year sevens who are very raw and just still learning the game and loving the game. And then you get your six formers that talk a little bit more, probably sense. And it's interesting to see different people's opinions of what they think of players. And, you know, from a, from being a player, obviously people have their opinions and can, and, and now hearing these lots, when they say something, I'm, I always ask them, why? Why do you say that? Mm. And try and get more of a, instant, rather than just going, oh, he's rubbish. It's like, why is he? He can't be that bad if he's doing yeah. this. And trying to educate him a little bit more that so they're not rubbish because they're, do a couple of bad passes or don't do something. So it's it's nice knowing that I've been there and done it, that I can sort of give it back to them. Mm. Well, well, COVID has affected, you know, school life, everyday life in a sense. And the one thing that it's affected in a sporting sense is, is the no crowds. And I'm sure mm. if 85,000 fans were in that stadium, you know, it, it would have made that game just a few percent better, even though it was brilliant. Um, what, what did you make of the game on Saturday between England and France? I thought it was an absolutely great game. For a, for a spectator, a neutral, someone who's new to rugby, it was everything that rugby should be. Um, I think France obviously came out the blocks really well, but again, that England nature of just never say die attitude that they have, and they got themselves back in the game. You know, France came back. England then, you know, talk about cliches of playing right to the end, you know, a Toji scores and we win the game. And I don't think anyone gave us. England a chance to win that game. You know, the French have been on a roll, rightly so. They've been incredible over the Six Nations, you know, and they're so dangerous. You saw by, you know, rare that teams, especially international level, score off first phase moves. Mm. Uh, You know, the French have that in the locker now, which is a scary thing. But the way that England defended, you know, you look at Curry and Otoji and people like that, they were right up in the French faces. So it was just a great game. Mm. And I think Owen, again, there's been a lot about Owen and right, wrongly so, I would say, you know, he led from the front. He, he did everything right. He was he was the glue in the middle, I thought. Um, and it was nice to see Max Malin at fullback and seeing yeah. him run it back a little bit more. And just I felt that it had a bit of a different edge to that game. And hopefully now England can kick on and, you know, the French will then be the French and they'll, they're the ones that can obviously... Can they go at Wales? Can they catch Wales now? I'm not sure they can. Um, there's so many technical things that go on. Yeah. So basically, if France win the next two games with a bonus point victory, so that's 10 points, and Wales don't get yeah. any points out of the game in Paris. France are yeah. champions. So it's crazy to think that Wales are nine <laughs> points clear with one round to go, but yet yeah, they, they still haven't won it. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, but yeah, just on a whole, I think it's been great uh, <laughs> to get any type of rugby mm. back involved. I know you talk about the crowds and it is a big factor. People say it's not, but it is. I imagine you speak to some of the lads and they say it's just a bit weird. You know, decisions don't go your way anymore. The crowd sometimes influence that. You know, last nine minutes, is it different when the crowds are, are right up there? It, it probably would be a little bit of a different game, but it's great just to see rugby on. Mm. And, well, the England players, some players have, have taken a lot of stick and the management's actually took a lot of stick over the last few weeks where the players who were in form aren't being played and whatnot. Um, do you think that was the perfect way to respond on Saturday? And how big a victory was that, not just for England, but for Eddie Jones in particular? Yeah, I think it was a, it was a good win. And it's one of these weird things in sport is that people forget, mm. very quick to forget and jump on. You know, Eddie Jones took the job and pretty, pretty much put England back on the map. Mm. I think he went 14, 15 games unbeaten. 
um, and they got right back to where they were. And, you know, maybe some teams have worked them out. And international rugby is such small margins. It's mm. tiny, bounce the ball, this and that. You know, rightly so, you're in one of the most high power jobs. So you're going to be under pressure a lot. But I definitely don't think it's right, the fact that he needed that one game. You know, he's a great coach. The boys absolutely love him from the outside, what I know, who, who I speak to. Yes, there's been a lot of things about different players, but, you know, that's the beauty of being a coach mm. is that it's your opinion that matters. You know, you are the head coach. It, it starts with you and it falls with you. And if you've got your players that you want to play, great. You know, do I agree with some of the selections? Maybe not, but that's not right for me to say, you know. He has his way and at the weekend it's shone. You know, I thought Billy Van Apollo had the best game he's had in a long time. Mm. Um, but is some other players playing just as good? But just because they're playing really well at premiership level, sometimes that international level is a different level. Um, yeah. And I, I'd like to see him getting involved in the training squads a bit more and seeing that side of stuff and then, you know, maybe dibbing him in, dibbing him out. Mm. But at the end of the day, it all lies with him. And, you know, he's, he's done very well for English rugby, I would say. Mm. Well, well, there's a few things I picked up from what you said there. You know, when Eddie Jones was first um, appointed as England coach, I said Wales are in trouble now. England have had this sort of bad patch now for the World Cup in 2015. Yeah. Eddie Jones is the man that's going to take them to that next level. And he was absolutely right. Now, on Billy Vunapola, do you think it's unfair that, you know, maybe they haven't had the game time that they've uh, the players have had for Saracens because... There's been no rugby for Saracens over the last few months, but now they've had a sort of um, you know games in a row for England now that they sort of catching their form back. Yeah, and it's a scary thing, isn't it? Really, for, for other teams yeah. um, when you have a, a Billy Van Napola running like he was at the weekend, it is scary. And an Owen Farrell and a Mario Tochi and a Jamie George. You know, I do think that rugby is such a tough sport that you need to be playing. You, you know, you can be the fittest man in the world on fitness tests and the most skillful, but you need game time under your belt to improve and to keep that sort of mind going. So I, I, I do understand when people are saying, you know, why they're not playing, why they're not playing, they need to play games. I get it. But then now with four, four games in, they're now starting to, to hit their straps a little bit more. So next weekend should be a very interesting game. But you know, again, it comes down to Eddie Jones. If he's happy with that, then... He's the man, so. Mm, yeah. Well, well, there must have been times when you were in the England camp where there would have been questions asked of the players when, when you were there and, and the coaching management, and you would have played with some of the players that would have gone through the critics over the last few weeks. Uh, how do you think um, they would have responded in the England camp and in training? They would have definitely kept it in-house. Uh, and, you know, you, you, the cliche thing of, you know, the press, you get, you get good press, you get bad press. And mm. it affects certain individuals differently. Um, you know, I had a... I had a heck of a lot over my career, but it's just the way it is. When you're in the limelight and you're at the top, and the not the beauty, the thing about social media is everyone has an opinion and mm. there's nothing you can do about it. So mm. you have a great game, you get all the beautiful press, you have maybe a not so good game and someone doesn't like how you play. But at the end of the day, as long as you've got the inner belief is a group of players and you've got a good support network, a family network, and it doesn't really matter what other people think. Mm. You know, you've yeah. just got to block it out, go about your business, if the lads around you and the staff around you believe in you, then you're doing the right thing and you've just got to block out the rest. Yes, it's hard on certain times, but you've got to be able to block it out. And I know as an England camp, they definitely would have been tighter than ever blocking out that side of it all and just getting on with it. Mm. Well, we saw the likes of Max Malins and Luke Cowan Dickey given a chance and Charlie Ewers and, and they all performed really well. And Elliot Daly then, you know, it's good that these players are now sort of getting pressure behind them. You know, Eddie Jones hasn't really been in the mood of dropping the Saracens players. And he dropped Elliot Daly um, for the weekend and Max Malin's come in. But Elliot Daly actually come on and played really well. Um, what have you made of the players that have come in? And do you think maybe the likes of Sam Simmons should now be given a chance? Yeah, it's, it's one of these things I've heard a lot of podcasts lately and stuff of saying, the more you talk about him, the less you'll get picked. So, yeah. you know, I don't really want to talk about it. For him. <laughs> um, you know, he... Yeah, he's a great player. You know, he's played a certain amount of caps now. He's a good player. You know, again, it comes down to, would I pick him? I think on form, he's probably doing really well, but I'm not picking him on one team. Um, yeah. You know, could he come off the bench with his explosive speed and power and what he does? 100%. But then, would you then take Ben Earls away, who's been playing absolute class as well? Mm. Um, and it's just now, and as you picked on before about the strength and depth that England have is just mm. phenomenal. Mm. Um, 
you know, touch wood, it never happens. But any injuries, it's the next one up. And it's mm. just the plethora of players they have in England now are, are phenomenal. And there is people like Simmons and Don Brand and people like that who are not even getting picked because there's so many more people. Um, but going back to your point, it was great to see Max Mayland playing. And it was great to see Elliot Daly come on and respond. Mm. And, you know, and in rugby, you need to be pushed. You can't be in your comfort zone and comfortable because if you're in your comfort zone and comfortable in rugby, you slip away. You need these youngers or anyone's pushing you all the way. And mm. Max Mayland's obviously pushing Elliot. Max Mayland's played really well, but Elliot Daly's come on and done exactly, responded in exactly the right way. And he's mm. come on, he's run the ball back, he's made the right decisions, and he's played really well. And now it's a selection issue for Eddie Jones for the last game. And that's what you want. You don't want people just turning up going, I'm in the squad. Mm. And it's weird in sport, really. You, you might have, uh, you know, maybe when a team is 10 points behind with, with 10 minutes to go, the game plan changes, doesn't it? And you start playing more off the off the cuff stuff, and that's what I saw yeah. with England on on Saturday. It was almost like backs against the wall, um, and you know England have had this bulldog mentality, you know that you know going up against the rest of the world and nobody likes us, but we don't care. And that's where it seemed like they they pulled out on Saturday, but they were, you know Ed, uh, Henry Slade was making breaks. Anthony Watson yeah. was superb. Um, what what sort of game plan do you think should be implemented implemented? in the Ireland game next week? Because if you watched the Ireland game yesterday, it was a lot of unstructured rugby. W- will England want that yeah. next week or will they try and keep it tight and take the points when they're on offer? I, I think they'll take the points when they're off. I think international rugby are three points. Mm. You know, don't don't throw away three points. If it is in the corner and you've, as a captain, as a senior player, you have to get a feel for the game. If your line going really well, and you're camped in the 22, you want to be put in the corner, and you've got to be brave in the international rugby sometimes. Um, I do think they'll want to play an extensive game of rugby. You know, when you've got Johnny May and Anthony Watson out wide and you know Henry Slick, you want to use these players, and they need to use the whole pitch. So I love, you know, from the weekend's games, you know, the cross-field kicks, you know, things like the bounce of a rugby ball. So get wide and get them unstructured. Because Ireland, if you go toe-to-toe with Ireland, they're a tough team to beat. You know, they're Andy Farrell, you know, defensive king. You know, he's going to get them off the line. They're going to be revved. So if you're just going to put up your jump and run at them, they're going to want that. We need to move them around and use the whole the whole pitch. You know, play in the right areas 100%. But what you don't want to do as Ireland is run up, run up your own backside because that's mm-hmm. what they'll feed them. You know, they've got a great back row. So we have to play field position to mm-hmm. then get that field position and that turn the screw a little bit to then get into that expensive game of rugby. Mm. And you mentioned Andy Farrell there. You you played with him, um, yeah. or you played under him, sorry, uh, for England when he was defence coach, uh, when he was working with um, Stuart Lancaster. Um, despite the victory yesterday, there's still calls for him to get the sack maybe at the end of the tournament because maybe they're not playing the style of rugby that the Irish fans want. And, you know, we've seen it in the past with Warren Gatlin when he was lost his his, his job with Ireland, having done such a successful job. And, and they want a particular sort of a, a game plan. Um, what, what have you made of his time as Ireland coach? And do you think he still needs time to embed his game plan? Yeah, 100%. 100% needs more time. Mm. You know, you can't just be thrown into a job um, and then just expect it to wave a magic wand and it all be okay. Mm. You know, he has... He needs time, and his 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 probably time is the World Cup. Mm. He needs everything firing for that year, and I think the French are the best of it. You know, they have down years, and then just somehow they come alive in the World Cup. And he needs time. He's an incredible coach. He mm. knows his stuff. He have the boys. The boys will play for him. If you speak to any of the Irish lads, I imagine they'll all say the same thing. He's great. Mm. They'll play for him, no matter what. They need certain individuals or certain people to probably come alive a little bit more. Um, I would say. But, you know, you got your Ty Furlongs back. You know, you saw him at the weekend. He's phenomenal. He gets a few other players back. You know, he's put young players in, you know, the fullback Keegan, he's put them in. You know, beforehand, other coaches have come in, kept the same, whereas he's come in and he's brought young people in. You know, Connor's in the back row. That Irish back row was the same for years. Mm. And he's brought someone else in. He's brought the young Leinster second row. I think he made his debut, didn't he, on Saturday? Yeah. He came on. You know, they're just bringing younger players in and he needs time to bed them in and bring them up to that international standard. And he's definitely the right man for that job. Mm. And, and on the game on, on Sunday, do, do you think the, the four-week break affected Scotland? Because in, in my opinion, I'm not saying France would have uh, you know, maybe won without a four-week break on Saturday. 
but it did sort of seem it affected them and it affected it looked like it affected Scotland as well on Sunday. Yeah, they were a little bit slow started, weren't they? They mm. it's always one of them things, rugby, rugby helps rugby. So yeah. as I said with the with the Saracens lads, you know, playing rugby is important. You can do as much in training, but it hasn't got the same intensity as, mm. as playing. Um they started slow. Um, you know, they're this type of team that needs to start fast. Finn Russell needs to get in the game early. Mm. You know, he needs one of their magic moments early to set in, but but they're in the game. You know, they got back to 20 all, and then obviously it's a penalty. So it could have, again, international rugby could have gone a completely different way. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're playing some really, really expensive games of rugby at the moment. And when you have Finn Russell at 10, you know they're going to play that and he's going to pull tricks out of his bags. Mm-hmm. You know, I think their forwards are now a, a power. Mm. You know, they've got strength in depth. You know, their back row are phenomenal. Hamish Watson leads from the front. Johnny Gray, always in the mixer. I think their halfbacks are settled. And Stuart Hogg also has that little bit of magic. You know, and, and, and it's great when they bring people off the bench. Like Hugh, Hugh Jones comes off and, mm. and first touch of the ball, he scores. So they have that strength in depth, which is great to see for, for Scottish people and for the Scottish nation because I, I think they are still a little bit of a sleeping giant. And Mm. When it all clicks like it did against England, they are a very, very good team. Mm. Do, do, do you almost feel that victory over England in the first game was almost their Everest? Because I, I, I've, I've talked to George Shooter in the past and he said that the way in, um, Wales and Ireland won the Grand Slams in 2005, 2008, 2009, um, they got over beating England. So it wasn't the, as long as we beat the English, we don't care. It was yeah. we beat England and we'll go on to the next game. Do you think Scotland have suffered that what Wales and Ireland used to go through beating England and that was like their Everest? Maybe, yeah. And it, it you know, there was so much, there's always so much on that game. Mm. And the fact that it was first up and how they went about it, you know, that was probably their pinnacle. Mm. But then the next two games, they've played very well in the next two games. It's not as if they've been beaten England mm. and then been hammered. Mm. You know, they've lost by really small margins and that is international rugby. Mm. But yeah, the energy that they use against England is always huge. You know, everyone talks about it. 16 years, you know, they've never won. They go and win. It's it's all rosy. And then they win, they lose their next two games. And it's like, whoa, well, Scotland now won one, lost two. So we're back to square one with them. Mm. But them small margins, they could have beat Ireland. You know, they could have drew against Ireland. You know, mm. it's, it's just one of them wicked things. International rugby is a wicked thing. But yeah, their energy might have been all used and not playing in the last four weeks might have gone against them. But let's see what they're like in that last game. Mm. Well, the last, I said earlier in the show that I'd had Nick Easter on last week and I asked him whether Wales have been lucky during the tournament. And he said, yes, they have been lucky. They played 16 against 15 against England with the French ref. And it caused quite a stir, a few thousand views on, on Facebook and social media. Um, what, what have you made of the Welsh team during the tournament? And have they been lucky? I don't think... God, you make your own luck. Um, yeah. You know, they... they and it, when it comes to the referees and stuff, my brother's actually a referee now, which <laughs> so I, always have to be care- I always have to be careful. You know, with a referee, you have to play the referee, you know. And it's, has he made a mistake? Maybe, but that's not the Welsh team's fault. Mm. You know, they've not gone about it and gone, oh, please do this. You know, mm. that is an issue for outside of them. They've just gone into the game and they've, and they've won the game. Mm. And it's nothing to do with them. They've not, che- they've not cheated. I'm not going to say it's cheating. Mm. But they've not done something wrong for them to win the game. Mm. So is it luck? Maybe, but you make your own luck. You know, mm. if that goes the other way, it's completely different. Mm. And I think on Wales, they've built. You know, and two, a year ago, everyone was saying, you know, it's Pivac, you know, he's not the right person, he, mm. you know, and he's given him a bit of time. He's tinkled with the squad. He's done little bits to it. I think it's, I think it's genius putting George North at 13. Mm. I've played with him and he's a phenomenal athlete, you know, great hands, you know, his mm. defensive work's getting better. And that 13 channel is a bit different to the wing, but, you know, he, he is an international 13. Mm. Uh, and then you've got your stardust of your Adams and your... Reece Summits and Liam Williams, you know, wh- why would any team want to kick the ball to that three? Mm. You know, and, and he's been great of how he's handled Sheedy as well. You know, the Welsh press obviously wants Sheedy start, start, start. <laughs> but Dan Bigger just dominates. Even mm. if it is for 50 minutes, he dominates. The, he's still a world-class player. Mm. And they have a lovely mix of Bigger going on and just getting him into the right position and Sheedy can just come on and be Sheedy rather mm. than starting Sheedy. Put all that pressure. I think the way that he's handled that's been great. It's lovely to see the scrum he's putting in. 
you know, Kieran Hardy, I played against him two years, three years ago when he was playing at Jersey. Mm. And now he's playing for well. So, you know, young kids out there know that if you have a dream of playing international rugby, stick at it and you can get there. You know, he played well. Sadly, he's got a hamstring injury now, but mm. they've got a conveyor belt of good scrum half. Mm. You know, Alan Wynne Jones, everyone was like, Alan Wynne Jones finished. He's probably been one of the best players in the Six Nations. Yeah. You know, and he, is he going to be Lions captain? If it was up to, if I was going to put a betting man on, I'd probably say yes. Yeah. Um, he's been that good. Um, Falatel's back to form. Tipperick's flying around. You know, Navidi's back. It, when Jones in the front row's been class. Mm. You know, they're they're a team that that should be where they're at. I mean, mm. Yes, have they been? Have they winding out games? Of course, they have. They've grinded them out. But international rugby, no one goes back and oh, who won that game? Oh, it was Wales. Oh, it was a terrible game. They just go, they won. Mm. Find yeah. a way to win at international rugby, and Wales have been great. And then. I loved at the weekend how they played against Italy. That was phenomenal, I thought. It was, for that first half, it was seamless mm. how they played, what they did with the board. Now I'm hoping they'll kick on again, you know. I just like seeing good running rugby and, and mm. having that mix of, of what Wales have got at the moment. It's perfect. Mm. And, and you mentioned his name earlier, George North. You played with him for a few years at uh, Northampton Saints and, and much was made of, of his move to England. We were like, oh no, the, the saviour's gone. He's gone to England. Is he going <laughs> to play for Wales now? Um, but, but on more of a serious note, uh, you know, he had a few concussions. He had, he had two in the game against England in 2015 at, at the Millennium Stadium. And then he had one or two for Northampton Saints. Um, how happy are you for, for him on a personal level for his re-emergence on, in the 13 jersey? Uh, I think it's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, you know, it, jo- like not joking aside, but off the field, like as a as a friend, he's just incredible. Mm. He doesn't take life too serious. He is he's a big kid, really, at the end of the mm. day. And he loves his rugby and whatever he gets, he deserves because he works mm. so hard on and off the pitch um, of, about his game. And seeing him now playing how he's playing at 13, because uh, he played a few games at Saints at 13. Mm. I remember the game he played against Leinster when we got hammered the week before and then he, he came in at 13 and he scores with second touch. He's just one of them players that whatever he touches seems to work. Mm. Um, and I think as a backline now going forward, Wales have a scary backline. They mm. have pace, power. You know, Jonathan Davies at 12, everyone was like, oh, I'm not sure. But he's like, he's like the glue in that midfield. Mm. You know, he's a cool head. He's a double British lion. He knows what he's doing. He knows my job is to feed everyone out there, give mm. them the ball, and I will tackle my heart out for you. And at the end of the day, his mm. offload to George North is absolutely outstanding. Because mm. everyone thinks now Wales are going to go wide. We're going to go wide. Jonathan Davis through the middle. Passes to George North. Not many 13s are as quick as George North. Mm. He scores a, a try from a 13, but also as a winger. This is scary. It's mm. a scary real thing, really, isn't it? Really, you've got these so many ball players and mm. speed now in that Welsh backline. It's just brilliant to see. Mm. And, and you played against a Grand Slam winning Wales side in 2012 um, at Twickenham. And I remember you had a really good game. You were taking quick taps. I was like, Ugh. Um, but you were up against the Warren Gatland type side, and it's been coined as the phrase now, Warren Ball. That's the way Wales played, and it was successful during that time. It was. But do do you think maybe this is what Welsh supporters and and fans want to see from Wales? Wales playing the type of rugby that they did in the seventies. Yeah, you know, and I think they've got they've got all the tools to do that. We mm. saw against Italy, you know, scoring 48, 27 nil at half time or scoring forty eight points is hard mm. in an international game. Yes, a lot of teams have done it, but how they did it was more impressive. Mm. You know, it wasn't just you know I know Ken Owens scored two two pushover tries. But it was the way they played, and they could have scored a lot more. Mm. Yes, you need that upfront grit to try and wear a team down. But I love the fact that they wanted to go wide first. Mm. Um, you know, I played in that 2012, and Wales were quite predictable, but mm. predictable, but try and beat it. Yeah. You know, it's like everyone says, oh, you go around the corner, we know what you're going to play. Yeah, you do, but can you stop it? Yeah. And that's what Wales were great at. They had a game plan under the Warren Gatlin. Could anyone else stop it? And people struggled to stop mm. it. So you can say it was a bit boring, but they're winning games. And that's where I always see it. And is, even if people know how you're playing, you've just got to still try and stop it. And when you've got you know, Mike Phillips at nine, you've got Toby Falatel, you've got these big ball coming around the corner. Mm. You've still got to tackle it. Mm. Yeah. And, and, try, and, and, and he was very successful. But I want to see Wade Pivak have his own, sort of his own sort of, structures now coming in who he's picking 
how he's wanting to play, you know, keeping Dan Bigger, I think, still great at 10 and having Sheedy come off is, is sort of a thing that I really like about him. Mm. But yeah, good luck, good luck to them. <laughs> well, well, two final questions, uh, uh, Lee. Who's going to win the Six Nations? Is it going to be a Grand Slam? And, and what are your predictions for next weekend? So I, I, I personally think, and I think it's right, that Wales should win the Grand Slam. I would like to see it, actually. I'd like to see someone win a Grand Slam and I think they deserve it. You know, what they've been what they've been doing, how they've handled stuff. You know, they've been a bit sleepy over the last couple of years and I think this is the year they actually deserve it. They've mm-hmm. played a good brand of rugby. They seem well gelled. They seem well structured. They've had hard-fought games and then they've had some lovely games. So I'd love to see them win. I can't see the French getting 10 points. Mm. Well, I maybe can the way they've been playing, but then I can also see Wales winning. Mm. Um, and England over in Ireland, I would like to see more of the same. It's going to be a little bit of a different game. I could see you know, Ireland will be fired up. You know, they've got a good win at the end of the day behind, behind them mm. yesterday. So they will be, they'll be fully up for it. And it'll be a battle. It's, mm. It'll be a battle. I can't see it being a, a big game, like a big scoring game, I can see it be battling the defences, really. And who's willing to maybe go off scripts a little bit more and, mm. and throw that pass and, and run it back and do something something different rather than being that structure. But also in that game, it's going to all to do with Sexton and Ford and Farrell of that field position. You know, mm. um, Gibson Parks, you know, great scrum half, really high tempo scrum half, but will they pick Conor and Murray pure field position in that kicking game? Personally, I hope they pick uh, Gibson Parks because I think he fizzes around a lot mm. um, and that's sort of how Ireland have started playing a little bit more they're playing a little bit wider rather you know Conor Miller is a phenomenal player but it was very much box kick or structure something like that whereas you know Jay, uh, Gibson Parks very more in and around that breakdown running a bit more so it'll be interesting to see actually very interesting to see mm. it'd be amazing if we can top that, that Super Saturday from 2015 that, that would be amazing wouldn't it um, yeah but, uh, before you go, Lee, is it okay if we finish with a quick fire round? Yeah, of course. Amazing. Right. So, uh, firstly, who's the best player you played with? Sammy Manoa. Uh, best player you've come up against? Uh, Bowden Barrett. Oof. Check that name in it. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> best friend in rugby? It, it, it could have been anyone in the yeah. New Zealand team, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. uh, best friend in rugby? Uh, la, la, la. Well, my best man and my best like, thing was Matthew Tate through school. Mm. I feel bad now I mentioned Gavin Ince. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It's all right. He's, he's, to... he's, he's, he's used to that. I'm yeah, I'll have to cut it that. out. <laughs> uh, your favourite coach? Oh, that is a tough one. My favourite coach, Mr. Martin Pepper, my school coach, who's still here now. Nice. Uh, pre-match rit- rituals? Uh, so my pre-match rituals, I would get up about 10 o'clock, come down, beans and sausage on toast was always my pre-match meal. <laughs> uh, shower, get ready, and then a bit of chill-out time. And then in the car, I would always have either a Diet Coke or a Blue Powerade and a bag of Skittles. <laughs> Ten Red Bulls like Jamie Vardy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, best match you've been involved in? Best match? Probably the Premiership final mm. uh, for Northampton Saints in 2014. The two, pretty much the double winning one where we won both back to back that year. We worked so hard over the years and had so many near yeses yeah. in the finals and no's. And then finally we get that double, which was unbelievable. Mm. Uh, worst drinker you've played with? Worst drinker I've ever played with, probably Stephen Myler. <laughs> does he drink? So, uh, he does. He, he drinks a bit, but just pure I just want to call him out. <laughs> <laughs> and he's doing amazing for the Ospreys, though, isn't he? Oh, he's, he, is, he is, if I have to say, everyone says it, it's like, you know, they say, oh, Stephen Myler is boring. He is absolutely class. Yeah. Do you want to win games? And you want to play away, he is the best at it. And his kicking mm. ability is just phenomenal. Unbelievable. What a player. Um, biggest mm. troublemaker on and off the field? Chris Ashton. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any stories? No, no stories. Just a good <laughs> lad. <laughs> just a good bloke. Uh, finally, if you weren't a rugby player, what would have been your dream job? Oh, dream job? Uh, I don't know, but I was going to join the army. I joined the Marines actually. Really? So when I was yes, when I was seventeen at school, I was always I'm from an army background, so I was going to mm. join the Marines and probably play and play rugby or sport through the 
through the Marines. So if I wouldn't have turned a professional rugby player at 18, I would have um, been in the, the Marines right now, probably still. Mm. It's amazing how uh, paths go yeah. in different ways, isn't it? And now yeah. look at you. you, you're a teacher now in Barnard Castle. I know, yeah. Uh, well, well, Lee, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, mate. Uh, I wish you all the best uh, for anything that you do in the future with the school or coaching uh, at professional level, maybe. We never know. Um, but enjoy the Six Nations on the weekend and uh, hopefully you have a good one, mate. Thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. <laughs>